So I know it's early. Um, so I'm going to make this easier on you guys. So we've been talking for the last, I've been talking to a lot of you the last 24 hours since I've been here about, and, and the conversation that I'm having a lot is, well, how are we going to, how are we going to control our content moving forward, given everything that's happening with, with piracy? How are we going to, how are we going to make this work? Um, so let's just, let's start with that. Let's figure that out first. Um, so here's, here's, here's your product as it exists online. It's a file. It's something you can copy an infinite number of times without losing any quality and, and broadcast across the world in an instant, completely undetected. It's kind of a hard thing to control. And I know it's very early in the morning, so I, let's, this, is, this is too big to start with. Let's make it slightly easier, right? So let's imagine that your product, the product that we're trying to control, isn't an infinitely reproducible file that you can transmit instantly. Let's make it, let's make it harder to copy so that we can sort of just you know, get the parameters right. Let's pretend that the product that you want people to stop sharing is actually a plant. So here's our plant. These are hard to copy, right? You've got to grow them and you've got to water them and special lights and so on. So there's the product. It's a plant and, and it's hard to share plants, especially if people don't want you to share them because, you know, we can do all sorts of things. You can have like special dogs that can sniff these plants and, and, and yeah, it, it's difficult. So I'm going to make it easier, even easier for you guys. Let's imagine that you can, instead of just sending people cease and desist letters or, or trying to sue them for sharing your product, let's imagine you can throw them in jail for really long periods of time, right? So just lock them up and throw away the key. Even better, let's imagine that you can mow people down in the street if they share a lot of these plants and, and the public will support you in this. You can gun people down willy-nilly. Now, I know it's early, so I'm going to make it even easier for you guys. I'm going to give you 40 years to do this and $1 trillion to throw at this effort. Do you think you can stop people sharing this kind of content now? Probably not. So this file, these files that you can share instant, instantaneously, yeah, we're not going to stop people sharing these things. Um, and so that's the good news. The bad news is it's going to get a lot worse. Anyone seen one of these things before? This is, called a, this is something called a 3D printer. I'm absolutely fascinated by these things. For, for those that don't know, they're basically very small desktop, or, or in this case, photocopier-sized factories. And they, produce, they print out physical objects in, in layers using ceramics and plastics and starches and, and metals. They're getting really sophisticated. And people use them in industrial design a lot because it's a way to not share a file with a factory somewhere. Um, so you see architectural models, prototypes of, of products, um, prototypes of new sneakers is a popular one. All kinds of companies are using these things. And what's interesting about them is Moore's Law is kind of in effect here. They're getting smaller and faster and cheaper every single year. And people in the 3D printing industry think that soon we'll have these things at home connected to the internet and we'll be able to print out consumer products at home. Well, that brings up some in interesting questions about what are we going to be able to copy. This is a, a soccer boot made by a company in London called Prior to Lever that will scan your foot and then print out the perfect soccer boot for you. Now, you pretty much have to be a professional soccer player to afford a pair of these right now. But that's now. They're getting smaller. They're getting cheaper. What are Nike going to do when people are downloading sneakers the way they downloaded music files? If that's not enough to think about first thing in the morning, there are already 3D printers on the market that can print out 3D printers. <laughs> so, so things are going to get worse. Copying is going to become more of an issue for, for, for more industries. Mark Getty said that intellectual property is the oil of the 21st century. And we, what he meant by that is we're going to have wars over it. And we were already seeing those wars starting. And, and we, we get that, right, in the content industries. All of us in this room, myself included, are concerned about people sharing the content that we make. And we see piracy as this problem and this threat. And what I want to talk about today, that as well as being a threat, it's also an opportunity. Piracy has always created innovation and, and has always been a source of, of the new and the wonderful and things that we couldn't imagine. So this is something that I, st I started to think about at a really young age. I, I grew up here in London. Um, 
obsessed with music and especially the music that was coming from the, the, the pirate radio stations that, that cover London. So you have them in Paris, you have them all over the world actually. They, they kind of look like this. So you have kids putting antenna scaffolding poles and duct tape up on tall tower blocks in inner cities, which you can use to reach millions of people if you're in a big enough city like London. Um, and I spent many of my weekends hold up in studios like this one. This is a station called Flex FM in West London. That This was taken in 2010. Ten years ago, it was a station that I used to DJ on. Um, I, wasn't, I wasn't a bad kid at school. I didn't get in a lot of trouble or anything like that. But I, and even though this was illegal and the police were trying to catch us, I had to become a pirate radio DJ because... I could see that it was Pirate Radio was really adding value to, to the culture I was part of, to the British music industry generally. And, and it was really, really popular. I, I ended up playing on a station called Ice FM, which is one of the biggest in London. And the police were trying to catch us, but they also used to advertise with us because we had a big enough audience. We had, if they wanted to get to 16 to 24 year olds, advertising on Ice FM was a, a really good media buy. So I was always really fascinated with the economics of this whole relationship and how it worked and how pirate radio added value to the rest of the, rest of the radio market. So here, here's the London radio market, this white space. And you've got two big companies that are broadcasting music to, to young people and they're, and they're sort of within these boundaries. But then you have the pirates over here, you have this grey market. And the way it adds value is the, these guys in, in, the, in the legitimate marketplace have very high overheads. It's the same story it is with radio stations all around the world. The best way to make money is to play the same 20 songs 20 times a day. Well, the pirates, it, do, it doesn't really work like that. People tune into the pirates for the new, new thing, the, the most experimental thing. So the pirates experiment, and, and they, can, uh, they can take bigger risks because they have lower overheads. So you get this kind of incubator of innovation over here and what these guys do is pull the most popular DJs and, and artists and records from the pirates and champion them. And that's, that's how music comes from the pirates and ends up going to the top of the national charts. And it creates this really interesting feedback loop where these guys have the money and can create the, the fame. And so these guys keep innovating and keep doing things the way they're doing them. And it's a really cool situation. And we're at a point now where we're all having to think about well, the, the same thing that the, the authorities in Britain think about pirate radio. It's like, what do we do about it? And, and fighting is the most obvious thing, and it's the thing that the content industries are doing the most of. And I, I don't think this is bad. And we need intellectual property laws, right? We need to protect the things that we make. And throughout our history, we've seen people fighting pirates. Musicians have long been fighting pirates, right? I mean, if you go back to... The first one of the first pirates that musicians fought was this guy, a man named Thomas Edison, who invented this infernal machine that plays these plastic discs that reproduce what live musicians do for a living. Live musicians were very upset about this guy. They literally called him a pirate and said, well, you know, well, this is going to ruin us. And you can understand the way they were thinking, right? And they figured it out with him in the end, and they created this thing called the record industry. But they were in the right at the time. Um, Edison, then eventually this guy became an upstanding member of society. Uh, he, he invented filmmaking technology and the moving picture was, was something he was a big part of. And he wanted filmmakers to pay him a license fee for using his technology. And he was faced with, with more pirates, this, including this guy named William. Now, William was a filmmaker from New York and he disagreed with this Edison guy and, and thought these, these fees for making films was way too high. So he got together with some of his friends and he fled to this small town close to the Mexican border, away from Edison's lawyers, and they started this anarchic community of pirate filmmakers. Uh, it's still there, it's called Hollywood, and that guy William's second name was Fox. So fighting pirates like Thomas and William has, has long been a good idea, but what you sort of tend to see happening is these periods of chaos just sort of become the new order in the end. And if that's really the case, the smart thing to do, and this is sort of where we are now, and, and I'm happy to say where a lot of the content industry's minds are at now, is actually the smart thing to do is kind of copy pirates, right? So, because it's really a market signal at this point. If you can't control it and people keep doing it and they want, they want to share this content no matter what it is, no matter what you say or do, really that's a market signal that there's something going on outside your market. We saw this in the music industry the last, the last two decades. Music industry was here electronic distribution was over here at the in the end of the 90s it was piracy it was it was a, not a good idea 
and they didn't copy the pirates. It was it was Apple that did, and now this space outside of this white square is kind of seventy five percent of the music business now, and, and these guys kind of got marginalised. You guys in TV don't want this to happen. We're seeing people copy the user experience of pirate TV, and we're things like Hulu and YouTube. This is how they they came around. So. Copying pirates is a really good idea. I'm not going to talk to you guys about that. I think you get it. If you, we all sort of do now. It's it's one of these two things. But there's more. There's more things we can be doing in the content industries to kind of get ahead of this thing. One of those things is letting pirates copy you. Not just copying them, but actively just letting people copy what you do and figure out new things to do with it. This is an, a behaviour that powers a lot of industries and has a really, really good effect on those industries. So take the, the video game business, for example. <coughs> this is an industry, a lot, lot of problems with piracy, but it's also an industry that thrives because people do copy content in certain questionable ways that the industry's always kind of been all right with. And, and the story starts like this. It starts with this game here, a game called Castle Wolfenstein, which was released for the Apple II back in 1981. It was a, it was a cool game. Um, the, the idea is you're, you're a, an allied spy traversing this castle, fighting it out with the Nazis in World War II. Really popular game. These three kids in the States, these three 11-year-olds, just kind of weren't into it. They liked, the, they liked the, way, the, the mechanics of it, but they didn't like the theme. They weren't really into World War II games, whatever it was. They found a back door into this game. They found a way to into the code. This is the first time this had ever happened. And these three 11-year-olds messed around with Castle Wolfenstein and they, they changed the, all the, the Nazis into the things that they were really scared of as 11-year-olds, which were the Smurfs. And they created Castle Smurfenstein. <laughs> and, and in Castle Smurfenstein, instead of the, being confronted with pixelated Nazis, you see these little blue and white killing machines who would garble at you in Smurf talk before trying to riddle you with bullets. And they, they shared this, this version of Wolfenstein on, bullet, on bulletin boards with their friends, and it became this underground hit, and people loved this, loved this idea that you could go into a game and start messing around with it. And the other kids that grew up with the, these guys were really influenced by this. One of those kids was a guy, a guy named John Carmack, who ran a company called id Software 10 years later, that bought the rights to Wolfenstein and created <coughs> Wolfenstein 3D, the first 3D first-person shooter. And as kind of a little shout out to Smurfenstein, they left some of the code unlocked in Wolfenstein. They, they let people go in and mess around with the characters and mess around with the levels and start making changes. And what they noticed was people, people started doing all kinds of cool things and coming up with new innovations and, and, and new level designs and new characters for this game. And it really extended the product life cycle of this game so much so that this suddenly became an industry standard people across the computer games industry started letting kids at home mess around with the games and mess around with the way levels were designed. Id Software went on to create Doom and Quake and all these games where, where the, this was the norm, just leaving, leaving code open for people to mess around with. Um, and we started to see something else happen because they were doing this. Kids started using game, game levels as sets for making movies and using the characters as actors and this whole new art of filmmaking called Machinima was born, where, where people make films with, with games. So you've got the series Red vs. Blue, which is really awesome. You should check it out on YouTube. Um, the film Sundown, which is shot entirely on location within Grand Theft Auto San Andreas. MTV has a show where people make music videos with games. There's a Machinima festival. You can buy Machinima for dummies. There's this whole form of culture that grew because three 11-year-olds found a way into a game in the 80s. And that's really awesome. Letting people copy you is, is one of the reasons that the R&D costs tend to be quite low in the games industry and the innovation happens so quickly. Because a lot of this stuff just happens outside of the system. The fashion industry is another really good example where this happens. So fashion has all kinds of problems with people illegally copying each other's products. But what's interesting about fashion is you can't copyright a 3D garment. Once something's out there, it's fair game for anybody to copy it. So you can copy the 2D design, you can have trademarks on there, but the actual way the garment looks, no, that's, that's anybody can copy that, and there's good reason for that in the fashion business. It's because, because people can copy each other, that's why we have trends. So it works like this, a, a designer comes up with a skinny jean design, right? And other designers look at that, and that's cool, I'm gonna do my own take on that. 
so the next season on the catwalks, everybody's wearing these skinny jeans and suddenly celebrities are wearing them. And soon we're all wearing them like they're going out of fashion. And so that's really, there's two things that happen here. Because people can copy each other, trends are created. And because once the trend becomes so ubiquitous that skinny jeans are being sold in Walmart for 16 bucks, well, that's a market signal to fashion designers in Paris, right, that it's time to move on. So letting people copy you is a really, really good idea. Um, another way to think about competing with pirates is if, if they're giving away something for free that you sell, there are other things that you can sell that they will never, ever be able to copy. Um, one of them is convenience. So think about Linux versus Windows. This is a, a really good example of this. Anyone in here a Linux user? No? Yeah, a couple of you. TV people. Um, so <laughs> Linux is a really cool operating system. It's, it's free. It's open source. People who use it love it. You talk to them and they, are, they will talk to you with religious fervor about this, this movement. And, and rightly so, it's awesome. Go and read some reviews of Windows 7 online. And people, I hate this, it's horrible, it burnt my eyes out of my head. Like, people do not like Windows, they never have. This is still 80 to 90% of the market, and this is still about 1% of the market, even though this is free and this costs money and is awful. Why? Because it's convenient. It's the thing we grew up with. It's the thing you have at home. It's the thing that you know. Who has time to go and learn Linux, even though it's pretty easy to use? None of us. We'll just keep using Windows or whatever. Same thing with iTunes versus all the pirate music sites. All of the music that iTunes sells is, is, a, is available a click away, usually for free, often at higher quality if you know, know where to look. But no one really knows where to look. And, th and that's really one of the things that we all kind of forget. I mean, everybody's very worried about piracy and worried about all this stuff. But you know what? The truth is, on the online world, for a lot of people, is just always going to be a magic box for looking at funny pictures of cats and buying shoes. And those people don't have time. And they will, they will pay for you to make something more convenient or, or to give them a better experience. So think about this industry. This is crazy. The bottled water industry in the United States is worth $8 billion. 42% of the bottled water in the United States is dirtier than the free stuff that comes out of taps in every home and business in America. And yet this is worth $8 billion because we're not buying water, we're buying an experience, buying the convenience of the bottle, we're buying a, a nice font or a picture of the French Alps or whatever it is. Same thing in, same thing in, in Hollywood. Th this is just all about selling experiences and, and in the TV industry, and it always has been. I feel really sorry for you guys. I mean, you guys have it worse than anyone. I, I work at an ad agency in, in New York on Canal Street, and when I'm walking up and down Canal Street, I talk to some of the, the pirates selling DVDs there, and I'm just, you know, how's business? And you always hear the same thing. Oh, pff, not good. Oh, why is that? Oh, pff, everybody's downloading movies at home now. In a business where the pirates are complaining about other pirates, I mean, I really feel for you guys, but box office receipts keep going up year after year because this is a better experience. You know, the TV industry is doing okay because sitting at home and watching something on your couch is still better than actually watching it online. There's, if, if the experience keeps getting better, I think we'll be okay. And one thing I'm fascinated by, and I know everybody here is fascinated by it, is the concept of transmedia and, and what it means. And... What I love about it is that I think it actually pirate-proofs content. I think if, if you put something in a lot of different places, what you're really doing, if people have got all kinds of options for getting your stuff for free, a really smart thing to do is not to fight that, but to just give them more options to pay for it. So a good example is Heroes, which is the most pirated, one of the most pirated TV shows in the world. And everybody in the TV industry knows this story and the case study of Heroes and how they disseminate the story in all these different ways and create this ecosystem of content. A lot of it was all over the place online. You had free comics that they were doing with DC that were freely available as PDFs, and then you could buy the comic in the store. But then they sold advertising around the PDF online and around the webisodes on NBC.com and different stuff on Hulu, etc., etc. Although Heroes was the, is the most, one of the most pirated shows in the world, it makes 50 to $100 million a season on all of this stuff, not including TV ad revenue, because of all the people looking for it and sharing it online, going and actually finding the legitimate stuff too. So creating a really good ecosystem around people pirating your stuff is actually a much better way of, of le leveraging value from it. So as I said, I, I work for a company called Syrup, which is a, an advertising agency. And we, we've, we did the Hope Act Change campaign for Obama. 
Eco Imagination for GE. We do a lot of fashion stuff. Uh, we work with Puma quite a lot. And we, we saw this, we saw something happen really interesting. Advertising is different. This is why I wanted to talk to you guys about this. In advertising, you're trying to just give people your content. You're trying to get it to them wherever they are, and you're, you're not trying to sell them anything directly. But more and more with good advertising, we're starting to see that people want to buy it anyway. And this, this happened to us. We did a campaign for Puma for the World Cup, um, and this was the tagline, love equals football. The idea being that Nike and Adidas are all about war and winning at all costs, you know, impossible is nothing, just do it. And Puma didn't have the money or the players to really say anything like that. So we talked about the fans and, and love and football being kind of the same thing. And people really liked this idea, so we did what all good ad agencies do. We, we threw it everywhere and we created an ecosystem of print, a print campaign and films online and outdoor and websites and events. And people really picked up on the idea and to the point where they were drawing it on walls and on t-shirts and players were shaving it into the back of their heads before matches. So we create this entire ecosystem of content, not meaning to sell things directly. It doubled the size of Puma's team sport business, but this was never, we were never supposed to sell this idea. They've sold 5 million t-shirts with this logo on it, just because if you put the idea out there enough, you create, pe people will do stop at nothing to copy your ideas if they like them, but they'll also stop at nothing to reward you for it if you just figure out the right way to do that and make that transaction happen. And I think that's what's really interesting about this business now. It's about creating ecosystems. It's not about fighting the natural way things are. It's about finding new ways, new ways to kind of get people to interact with you that make sense for you as well. I'm gonna leave you with one final thought. Um, if someone's copying your stuff, who should you consult first? Because I know that a lot of you guys tend to get this the wrong way around in the TV business. Should it be legal or should it be marketing? So I'm gonna, gonna tell you a little story that sort of highlights really what I'm trying to say with this point. So going back to 2006, Fox was about to release um, Die Hard 4. And the marketing team at Fox are trying to think of a fun way to get people excited about, about the, the first three Die Hard films online. How do we get people talking about these films again and thinking about them? And they're sitting there scratching their heads. And, and little do they know, a comedy rock band called Guys Night has just released a song called Die Hard, where they sing the plot synopsis of the first three Die Hard films. I'm gonna, gonna show you it quickly. I'm really sorry, I'd love to show you the rest of that, but for legal reasons, I can't. So go and watch it online, very, very funny. So Guys Night put this out on YouTube and you know went viral, millions of people watched it, usual story. Um, and the marketing team had no idea at Fox. The legal team did find out and they saw this, oh look, there's our content, okay. Cease and desist letter to YouTube, cease and desist letter to the band. They called the band and said, look, can you take this down? And Guys Night said, oh okay, sorry, and they took it down. A couple of weeks later, the marketing team at Fox find out about this video and they call up Guys Night. Hi, we're from Fox. How much do we have to pay you to put this video you made on YouTube? <laughs> and they, they went to the premiere and it was a, you know, the story had a happy ending. But the, the point is that actually a lot of this stuff is adding value. And, and the first thing that all of us should do is try and look for that value and try and figure out how we're going to extract it. My, my favorite scene in Die Hard is when Hans Gruber, the evil villain played by Alan Rickman, is talking to uh, Holly McLean, Bruce Willis, John McLean's wife, and she says to him, you're nothing but a common thief. And he turns and looks at her very, very offended, and he says, I'm an exceptional thief, Mrs. McLean. And I think this is really the difference we need to understand here. Yes, there are common thieves taking our content and doing things with it they shouldn't be, and sometimes we should be fighting them. But we should also be thinking about the exceptional thieves and the people taking our stuff and doing really awesome things with it because those are the people we should be competing with. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the Pirate's Dilemma. Thank you very much.
very little time um, because we've been rushed because the next speaker has to leave right after her speech. So I'm afraid that we have a couple of questions. But uh, my first one was, um, uh, would you say that the, uh, the pirates represent the new underground? Uh, yeah, I think piracy kind of, piracy is interesting. It, it, one of the things that I really didn't get actually about the way the music industry responded to piracy was the music industry is the greatest industry in the world at taking subcultures and, and radical things from the edge yeah. and, turning, and, and totally turning them into corporate money-making machines. Like if you look at hip-hop or you look at punk, or disco. Disco started, it was a gay black underground movement in New York City. And by the time the major labels had finished with it, it was John Travolta in sequins. Yeah, uh, right. and, and, and piracy <laughs> downloading in the, in the late 90s was really, it was a, a form of youth culture more than anything. Yeah. And it still is today in terms of mm. the movement that's grown up there. A and the, that industry just completely missed that. And that was the thing they were best at doing and the thing they probably should have done. So, so right now we're in a situation where, in fact, there is no more avant-garde. There's every guard, everywhere, right? I mean, a pirate comes from anywhere, any, anywhere in the world and it starts something from... So the avant there's no more real avant-garde in either fashion or art or in anything. It's just that fragmented bits and pieces suddenly take off and take the whole scene, right? I think, yeah, I think it's just got more complex. It used to be easier to sort of see where the avant-garde was and where the, yeah. the lines between culture and commerce were and... And now you can't at all because all of those things mean different things in different contexts in different in different countries. Maybe one question for the audience, and then we here is one. Bring it there, and then we'll Hi. have to thank you very much for the. Hi, Matt. Hi, how you doing? So, um, I've, I've run, I, I'm a, a lawyer in New York, and I've run into uh, pretty significant battles with my litigation partners because I call them friendly infringers, and they call them pirates, mm -hmm. and we've taken to not sending cease and desist letters, but in fact sending emails that say, would you like a license? <laughs> yeah. You know, we have to make you say that we can stop you if we want, mm. but let's go, let's, let's do it together. But I guess my question for you is, if we could just jump to film for a second, what about the idea of variable pricing for films? Meaning, the less popular it is, the lower the price, the more popular it is, the more you have to pay for a ticket. Do you think that would keep films in the theaters more and perhaps eliminate some of the questions we're having about windows and exclusivity mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, if you look at what's happening, there was a really interesting stat that was on the screen earlier about how the number of file, music files shared has dropped since LimeWire went down. And it, I don't think it's got as much to do with the fact that LimeWire went down as it has with the fact that there, there are now so many legitimate ways to get music files. And that was really the problem. The, the tragedy of what happened in the music industry was that a generation of artists lost billions of dollars in revenue for, for a decade because the industry just didn't have the right perspective on it. But now that we're seeing the content industries get much more aggressive about innovating, that's the thing that's really gonna stop. And it's not even stopping it because the thing, that, the thing we've always been trying to do is change behavior, which is always a bad idea. But variable pricing, anything that just legitimizes the behavior and makes it part of the, n the new normal I is really the way to go. So, yeah, I think that's a great idea. Well, thank you very much, Matt. It's been a very thank a you. great reversal and a wonderful uh, thing to keep in mind. Absolutely.